We are inventing the future, Jobs told him at the end of a three-hour pitch. Think about surfing on the front edge of a wave. It's really exhilarating. Now think about dog paddling at the tail end of that wave. It wouldn't be anywhere near as much fun. Come down here and make a dent in the universe. Atkinson did. With his shaggy hair and droopy mustache that did not hide the animation in his face, Atkinson had some of Waz's ingenuity along with Jobs's passion for awesome products. His first job was to develop a program to track a stock portfolio by auto-dialing the Dow Jones service, getting quotes, then hanging up. I had to create it fast because there was a magazine ad for the Apple II showing a hubby at the kitchen table looking at an Apple screen filled with graphs of stock prices, and his wife is beaming at him. But there wasn't such a program, so I had to create one. Next, he created for the Apple II a version of Pascal, a high-level programming language. Jobs had resisted, thinking that BASIC was all the Apple II needed, but he told Atkinson, Since you're so passionate about it, I'll give you six days to prove me wrong. He did, and Jobs respected him ever after. By the fall of 1979, Apple was breeding three ponies to be potential successors to the Apple II workhorse. There was the ill-fated Apple III, there was the Lisa project, which was beginning to disappoint Jobs, and somewhere off Jobs' radar screen, at least for the moment, there was a small skunkworks project for a low-cost machine that was being developed by a colorful employee named Jeff Raskin a former professor who had taught Bill Atkinson. Raskin's goal was to make an inexpensive computer for the masses that would be like an appliance, a self-contained unit with computer, keyboard, monitor, and software all together, and have a graphical interface. He tried to turn his colleagues at Apple onto a cutting-edge research center right in Palo Alto that was pioneering such ideas. Xerox Park The Xerox Corporation's Palo Alto Research Center, known as Xerox Park, had been established in 1970 to create a spawning ground for digital ideas. It was safely located, for better and for worse, 3,000 miles from the commercial pressures of Xerox corporate headquarters in Connecticut. Among its visionaries was the scientist Alan Kay, who had two great maxims that Jobs embraced. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. And people who are serious about software should make their own hardware. Kay pushed the vision of a small personal computer, dubbed the Dynabook, that would be easy enough for children to use. So Xerox Park's engineers began to develop user-friendly graphics that could replace all of the command lines and DOS prompts that made computer screens intimidating. The metaphor they came up with was that of a desktop. The screen could have many documents and folders on it, and you could use a mouse to point and click on the one you wanted to use. This graphical user interface, or GUI, pronounced GUI, was facilitated by another concept pioneered at Xerox Park, bitmapping. Until then, most computers were character-based. You would type a character on a keyboard, and the computer would generate that character on the screen, usually in glowing greenish phosphor against a dark background. Since there were a limited number of letters, numerals, and symbols, it didn't take a whole lot of computer code or processing power to accomplish this. In a bitmap system, on the other hand, each and every pixel on the screen is controlled by bits in the computer's memory. To render something on the screen, such as a letter, the computer has to tell each pixel to be light or dark, or in the case of color displays, what color to be. This uses a lot of computing power but it permits gorgeous graphics, fonts, and gee whiz screen displays. Bitmapping and graphical interfaces became features of Xerox Park's prototype computers, such as the Alto, 
and its object-oriented programming language, Smalltalk. Jeff Raskin decided that these features were the future of computing, so he began urging Jobs and other Apple colleagues to go check out Xerox Park. Raskin had one problem. Jobs regarded him as an insufferable theorist, or to use Jobs' own more precise terminology, a shithead who sucks. So Raskin enlisted his friend Atkinson, who fell on the other side of Jobs' shithead-slash-genius division of the world, to convince Jobs to take an interest in what was happening at Xerox Park. What Raskin didn't know was that Jobs was working on a more complex deal. Xerox's venture capital division wanted to be part of the second round of Apple financing during the summer of 1979. Jobs made an offer. I will let you invest a million dollars in Apple if you will open the kimono at Park. Xerox accepted. It agreed to show Apple its new technology and in return got to buy 100,000 shares at about $10 each. By the time Apple went public a year later, Xerox's $1 million worth of shares were worth $17.6 million. But Apple got the better end of the bargain. Jobs and his colleagues went to see Xerox Parks' technology in December 1979, and when Jobs realized he hadn't been shown enough, got an even fuller demonstration a few days later. Larry Tesler was one of the Xerox scientists called upon to do the briefings, and he was thrilled to show off the work that his bosses back east had never seemed to appreciate. But the other briefer, Adele Goldberg, was appalled that her company seemed willing to give away its crown jewels. It was incredibly stupid, completely nuts, and I fought to prevent giving Jobs much of anything, she recalled. Goldberg got her way at the first briefing. Jobs, Raskin, and the Lisa team leader, John Couch, were ushered into the main lobby, where a Xerox Alto had been set up. It was a very controlled show of a few applications, primarily a word processing one, Goldberg said. Jobs wasn't satisfied, and he called Xerox headquarters demanding more. So he was invited back a few days later, and this time he brought a larger team that included Bill Atkinson and Bruce Horn, an Apple programmer who had worked at Xerox Park. They both knew what to look for. When I arrived at work, there was a lot of commotion, and I was told that Jobs and a bunch of his programmers were in the conference room, said Goldberg. One of her engineers was trying to keep them entertained with more displays of the word processing program but Jobs was growing impatient. Let's stop this bullshit, he kept shouting. So the Xerox folks huddled privately and decided to open the kimono a bit more, but only slowly. They agreed that Tesler could show off small talk, the programming language, but he would demonstrate only what was known as the unclassified version. It will dazzle Jobs, and he'll never know he didn't get the confidential disclosure the head of the team told Goldberg. They were wrong. Atkinson and others had read some of the papers published by Xerox Park, so they knew they were not getting a full description. Jobs phoned the head of the Xerox Venture Capital Division to complain. A call immediately came back from corporate headquarters in Connecticut decreeing that Jobs and his group should be shown everything. Goldberg stormed out in a rage. When Tesla finally showed them what was truly under the hood, the Apple folks were astonished. Atkinson stared at the screen, examining each pixel so closely that Tesla could feel the breath on his neck. Jobs bounced around and waved his arms excitedly. He was hopping around so much I don't know how he actually saw most of the demo, but he did because he kept asking questions, Tesla recalled. He was the exclamation point for every step I showed. Jobs kept saying that he couldn't believe that Xerox had not commercialized the technology. You're sitting on a gold mine, he shouted. I can't believe Xerox is not taking advantage of this. The small talk demonstration showed three amazing features. One was how computers could be networked. The second was how object-oriented programming worked. 
But Jobs and his team paid little attention to these attributes because they were so amazed by the third feature, the graphical interface that was made possible by a bit-mapped screen. It was like a veil being lifted from my eyes, Jobs recalled. I could see what the future of computing was destined to be. When the Xerox Park meeting ended after more than two hours, Jobs drove Bill Atkinson back to the Apple office in Cupertino. He was speeding, and so were his mind and mouth. This is it, he shouted, emphasizing each word. We've got to do it. It was the breakthrough he had been looking for, bringing computers to the people with the cheerful but affordable design of an Eichler home and the ease of use of a sleek kitchen appliance. How long would this take to implement, he asked. I'm not sure, Atkinson replied. Maybe six months? It was a wildly optimistic assessment, but also a motivating one. Great Artists Steal The Apple raid on Xerox Park is sometimes described as one of the biggest heists in the chronicles of industry. Jobs occasionally endorsed this view with pride. As he once said, Picasso had a saying, Good artists copy, great artists steal, and we have always been shameless about stealing great ideas. Another assessment also sometimes endorsed by Jobs, is that what transpired was less a heist by Apple than a fumble by Xerox. They were copier heads who had no clue about what a computer could do, he said of Xerox's management. They just grabbed defeat from the greatest victory in the computer industry. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry. Both assessments contain a lot of truth, but there is more to it than that. There falls a shadow, as T.S. Eliot noted, between the conception and the creation. In the annals of innovation, new ideas are only part of the equation. Execution is just as important. Jobs and his engineers significantly improved the graphical interface ideas they saw at Xerox Park, and then were able to implement them in ways that Xerox never could accomplish. For example, the Xerox mouse had three buttons, was complicated, cost $300 a piece, and didn't roll around smoothly. A few days after his second Xerox Park visit, Jobs went to a local industrial design firm, IDEO, and told one of its founders, Dean Hovey, that he wanted a simple, single-button model that cost $15, and I want to be able to use it on Formica and my blue jeans. Hovey complied. The improvements were not in just the details, but the entire concept. The mouse at Xerox Park could not be used to drag a window around the screen. Apple's engineers devised an interface so you could not only drag windows and files around, you could even drop them into folders. The Xerox system required you to select a command in order to do anything ranging from resizing a window to changing the extension that located a file. The Apple system transformed the desktop metaphor into virtual reality by allowing you to directly touch, manipulate, drag, and relocate things. And Apple's engineers worked in tandem with its designers, with jobs spurring them on daily, to improve the desktop concept by adding delightful icons and menus that pulled down from a bar atop each window and the capability to open files and folders with a double click. It's not as if Xerox executives ignored what their scientists had created at Park. In fact, they did try to capitalize on it, and in the process they showed why good execution is as important as good ideas. In 1981, well before the Apple Lisa or Macintosh, they introduced the Xerox Star, a machine that featured their graphical user interface, mouse, bitmap display, windows, and desktop metaphor. But it was clunky, it could take minutes to save a large file, costly, $16,595 at retail stores, and aimed mainly at the networked office market. It flopped. Only 30,000 were ever sold.
Jobs and his team went to a Xerox dealer to look at the star as soon as it was released. But he deemed it so worthless that he told his colleagues they couldn't spend the money to buy one. We were very relieved, he recalled. We knew they hadn't done it right, and that we could at a fraction of the price. A few weeks later, he called Bob Belleville, one of the hardware designers on the Xerox Star Team. Everything you've ever done in your life is shit, Jobs said. So why don't you come work for me? Belleville did, and so did Larry Tesler. In his excitement, Jobs began to take over the daily management of the Lisa project, which was being run by John Couch, the former HP engineer. Ignoring Couch, he dealt directly with Atkinson and Tesler to insert his own ideas, especially on Lisa's graphical interface design. He would call me at all hours, 2 a.m. or 5 a.m., said Tesler. I loved it, but it upset my bosses at the Lisa division. Jobs was told to stop making out-of-channel calls. He held himself back for a while, but not for long. One important showdown occurred when Atkinson decided that the screen should have a white background rather than a dark one. This would allow an attribute that both Atkinson and Jobs wanted. W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G, pronounced WYSIWYG, an acronym for What You See Is What You Get. What you saw on the screen was what you'd get when you printed it out. The hardware team screamed bloody murder, Atkinson recalled. They said it would force us to use a phosphor that was a lot less persistent and would flicker more. So Atkinson enlisted Jobs, who came down on his side. The hardware folks grumbled, but then went off and figured it out. Steve wasn't much of an engineer himself, but he was very good at assessing people's answers. He could tell whether the engineers were defensive or unsure of themselves. One of Atkinson's amazing feats, which we are so accustomed to nowadays that we rarely marvel at it, was to allow the windows on a screen to overlap so that the top one clipped into the ones below it. Atkinson made it possible to move these windows around, just like shuffling papers on a desk, with those below becoming visible or hidden as you move the top ones. Of course, on a computer screen, there are no layers of pixels underneath the pixels that you see, so there are no windows actually lurking underneath the ones that appear to be on top. To create the illusion of overlapping windows requires complex coding that involves what are called regions. Atkinson pushed himself to make this trick work because he thought he had seen this capability during his visit to Xerox Park. In fact, the folks at Park had never accomplished it, and they later told him they were amazed that he had done so. I got a feeling for the empowering aspect of naivete, Atkinson said. Because I didn't know it couldn't be done, I was enabled to do it. He was working so hard that one morning in a daze, he drove his Corvette into a parked truck and nearly killed himself. Jobs immediately drove to the hospital to see him. We were pretty worried about you, he said when Atkinson regained consciousness. Atkinson gave him a pained smile and replied, Don't worry, I still remember regions. Jobs also had a passion for smooth scrolling. Documents should not lurch line by line as you scroll through them, but instead should flow. He was adamant that everything on the interface had a good feeling to the user, Atkinson said. They also wanted a mouse that could easily move the cursor in any direction, not just up, down, left, right. This required using a ball rather than the usual two wheels. One of the engineers told Atkinson that there was no way to build such a mouse commercially. After Atkinson complained to Jobs over dinner, he arrived at the office the next day to discover that Jobs had fired the engineer. When his replacement met Atkinson, his first words were, I can build the mouse. Atkinson and Jobs became best friends for a while, eating together at the Good Earth most nights. But John Couch and the other professional engineers on his Lisa team, many of them buttoned-down HP types, 
resented Jobs' meddling and were infuriated by his frequent insults. There was also a clash of visions. Jobs wanted to build a Vokes Lisa, a simple and inexpensive product for the masses. There was a tug of war between people like me, who wanted a lean machine, and those from HP, like Couch, who were aiming for the corporate market, Jobs recalled. Both Mike Scott and Mike Markala were intent on bringing some order to Apple and became increasingly concerned about Jobs' disruptive behavior. So in September 1980, they secretly plotted a reorganization. Couch was made the undisputed manager of the Lisa division. Jobs lost control of the computer he had named after his daughter. He was also stripped of his role as vice president for research and development. He was made non-executive chairman of the board. This position allowed him to remain Apple's public face, but it meant that he had no operating control. That hurt. I was upset and felt abandoned by Markala, he said. He and Scotty felt I wasn't up to running the Lisa division. I brooded about it a lot. Chapter 9 Going Public a man of wealth and fame. Options When Mike Markala joined Jobs and Wozniak to turn their fledgling partnership into the Apple Computer Company in January 1977, they valued it at $5,309. Less than four years later, they decided it was time to take it public. It would become the most oversubscribed initial public offering since that of Ford Motors in 1956. By the end of December 1980, Apple would be valued at $1.79 billion. Yes, billion. In the process, it would make 300 people millionaires. Daniel Kotke was not one of them. He had been Jobs' soulmate in college, in India, at the All One Farm, and in the rental house they shared during the Chris Ann Brennan crisis. He joined Apple when it was headquartered in Jobs' garage, and he still worked there as an hourly employee, but he was not at a high enough level to be cut in on the stock options that were awarded before the IPO. I totally trusted Steve, and I assumed he would take care of me like I'd taken care of him so I didn't push, said Kotke. The official reason he wasn't given stock options was that he was an hourly technician, not a salaried engineer, which was the cutoff level for options. Even so, he could have justifiably been given founder's stock, but Jobs decided not to. Steve is the opposite of loyal, according to Andy Hertzfeld, an early Apple engineer who has nevertheless remained friends with him. He's anti-loyal. He has to abandon the people he is close to. Kotke decided to press his case with Jobs by hovering outside his office and catching him to make a plea. But at each encounter, Jobs brushed him off. What was really so difficult for me is that Steve never told me I wasn't eligible, recalled Kotke. He owed me that as a friend. When I would ask him about stock, he would tell me I had to talk to my manager. Finally, almost six months after the IPO, Kotke worked up the courage to march into Jobs' office and try to hash out the issue. But when he got in to see him, Jobs was so cold that Kotke froze. I just got choked up and began to cry and just couldn't talk to him, Kotke recalled. Our friendship was all gone. It was so sad. Rod Holt, the engineer who had built the power supply, was getting a lot of options, and he tried to turn Jobs around. We have to do something for your buddy Daniel, he said, and he suggested they each give him some of their own options. Whatever you give him, I will match it, said Holt. Replied Jobs, okay, I will give him zero. Wozniak, not surprisingly, had the opposite attitude. Before the shares went public, he decided to sell, at a very low price, 2,000 of his options to 40 different mid-level employees. Most of his beneficiaries made enough to buy a home. Wozniak bought a dream home for himself and his new wife, but she soon divorced him and kept the house. 
He also later gave shares outright to employees he felt had been shortchanged, including Kotke, Fernandez, Wigginton, and Espinoza. Everyone loved Wozniak, all the more so after his generosity, but many also agreed with Jobs that he was awfully naive and childlike. A few months later, a United Way poster showing a destitute man went up on a company bulletin board. Someone scrawled on it, Woz in 1990. Jobs was not naive. He had made sure his deal with Chris Ann Brennan was signed before the IPO occurred. Jobs was the public face of the IPO, and he helped choose the two investment banks handling it, the traditional Wall Street firm Morgan Stanley and the untraditional boutique firm Hambrecht and Quist in San Francisco. Steve was very irreverent toward the guys from Morgan Stanley, which was a pretty uptight firm in those days, recalled Bill Hambrecht. Morgan Stanley planned to price the offering at $18, even though it was obvious the shares would quickly shoot up. Tell me what happens to this stock that we priced at 18, Jobs asked the bankers. Don't you sell it to your good customers? If so, how can you charge me a 7% commission? Hambrecht recognized that there was a basic unfairness in the system, and he later went on to formulate the idea of a reverse auction to price shares before an IPO. Apple went public the morning of December 12, 1980. By then, the bankers had priced the stock at $22 a share. It went to $29 the first day. Jobs had come into the Hambreck and Quist office just in time to watch the opening trades. At age 25, he was now worth $256 million. Baby, you're a rich man. Before and after he was rich, and indeed throughout a life that included being both broke and a billionaire, Steve Jobs' attitude toward wealth was complex. He was an anti-materialistic hippie who capitalized on the inventions of a friend who wanted to give them away for free, and he was a Zen devotee who made a pilgrimage to India and then decided that his calling was to create a business. And yet somehow these attitudes seemed to weave together rather than conflict. He had a great love for some material objects, especially those that were finely designed and crafted, such as Porsche and Mercedes cars, Henkel's knives and brawn appliances, BMW motorcycles and Ansel Adams prints, Bosendorfer pianos and Bang & Olufsen audio equipment. Yet the houses he lived in, no matter how rich he became, tended not to be ostentatious and were furnished so simply they would have put a shaker to shame. Neither then nor later would he travel with an entourage, keep a personal staff, or even have security protection. He bought a nice car, but always drove himself. When Markala asked Jobs to join him in buying a Learjet, he declined though he eventually would demand of Apple a Gulfstream to use. Like his father, he could be flinty when bargaining with suppliers, but he didn't allow a craving for profits to take precedence over his passion for building great products. Thirty years after Apple went public, he reflected on what it was like to come into money suddenly. I never worried about money. I grew up in a middle-class family, so I never thought I would starve and I learned at Atari that I could be an okay engineer, so I always knew I could get by. I was voluntarily poor when I was in college in India, and I lived a pretty simple life even when I was working. So I went from fairly poor, which was wonderful because I didn't have to worry about money, to being incredibly rich when I also didn't have to worry about money. I watched people at Apple who made a lot of money and felt they had to live differently. Some of them bought a Rolls Royce and various houses, each with a house manager and then someone to manage the house managers. Their wives got plastic surgery and turned into these bizarre people. That was not how I wanted to live. It's crazy. I made a promise to myself that I'm not going to let this money ruin my life. He was not particularly philanthropic. 
He briefly set up a foundation, but he discovered that it was annoying to have to deal with the person he had hired to run it, who kept talking about venture philanthropy and how to leverage giving. Jobs became contemptuous of people who made a display of philanthropy or thinking they could reinvent it. Earlier, he had quietly sent in a $5,000 check to help launch Larry Brilliant's Siva Foundation to fight diseases of poverty, and he even agreed to join the board. But when Brilliant brought some board members, including Wavy Gravy and Jerry Garcia, to Apple right after its IPO to solicit a donation, Jobs was not forthcoming. He instead worked on finding ways that a donated Apple II and a VisiCalc program could make it easier for the foundation to do a survey it was planning on blindness in Nepal. His biggest personal gift was to his parents, Paul and Clara Jobs, to whom he gave about $750,000 worth of stock. They sold some to pay off the mortgage on their Los Altos home, and their son came over for the little celebration. It was the first time in their lives they didn't have a mortgage, Jobs recalled. They had a handful of their friends over for the party, and it was really nice. Still, they didn't consider buying a nicer house. They weren't interested in that, Jobs said. They had a life they were happy with. Their only splurge was to take a princess cruise each year. The one through the Panama Canal was the big one for my dad, according to Jobs, because it reminded him of when his Coast Guard ship went through on its way to San Francisco to be decommissioned. With Apple's success came fame to its poster boy. Inc. became the first magazine to put him on its cover in October 1981. This man has changed business forever, it proclaimed. It showed Jobs with a neatly trimmed beard and well-styled long hair, wearing blue jeans and a dress shirt with a blazer that was a little too satiny. He was leaning on an Apple II and looking directly into the camera with the mesmerizing stare he had picked up from Robert Friedland. When Steve Jobs speaks, it is with the gee whiz enthusiasm of someone who sees the future and is making sure it works, the magazine reported. Time followed in February 1982 with a package on young entrepreneurs. The cover was a painting of Jobs, again with his hypnotic stare. Jobs, said the main story, practically single-handed, created the personal computer industry. The accompanying profile, written by Michael Moritz, noted, At 26, Jobs heads a company that six years ago was located in a bedroom and garage of his parents' house, but this year is expected to have sales of $600 million. As an executive, Jobs has sometimes been petulant and harsh on subordinates. Admits he, I've got to learn to keep my feelings private. Despite his new fame and fortune, he still fancied himself a child of the counterculture. On a visit to a Stanford class, he took off his Wilkes Bashford blazer and his shoes, perched on top of a table, and crossed his legs into a lotus position. The students asked questions, such as when Apple's stock price would rise, which Jobs brushed off. Instead, he spoke of his passion for future products, such as someday making a computer as small as a book. When the business questions tapered off, Jobs turned the tables on the well-groomed students. How many of you are virgins? he asked. There were nervous giggles. How many of you have taken LSD? More nervous laughter, and only one or two hands went up. Later, Jobs would complain about the new generation of kids, who seemed to him more materialistic and careerist than his own. When I went to school, it was right after the 60s, and before this general wave of practical purposefulness had set in, he said, now students aren't even thinking in idealistic terms, or at least nowhere near as much. His generation, he said, was different. The idealistic wind of the 60s is still at our backs, though, and most of the people I know who are my age have that ingrained in them forever. Chapter 10 the Mac is born. You say you want a revolution?
Jeff Raskin's Baby Jeff Raskin was the type of character who could enthrall Steve Jobs or annoy him. As it turned out, he did both. A philosophical guy who could be both playful and ponderous, Raskin had studied computer science, taught music and visual arts, conducted a chamber opera company, and organized guerrilla theater. His 1967 doctoral thesis at UC San Diego argued that computers should have graphical rather than text-based interfaces. When he got fed up with teaching, he rented a hot air balloon, flew over the chancellor's house, and shouted down his decision to quit. When Jobs was looking for someone to write a manual for the Apple II in 1976, he called Raskin, who had his own little consulting firm. Raskin went to the garage, saw Wozniak beavering away at a workbench, and was convinced by Jobs to write the manual for $50. Eventually, he became the manager of Apple's publications department. One of Raskin's dreams was to build an inexpensive computer for the masses, and in 1979, he convinced Mike Markula to put him in charge of a small development project codenamed Annie to do just that. Since Raskin thought it was sexist to name computers after women, he redubbed the project in honor of his favorite type of apple, the Macintosh. But he changed the spelling in order not to conflict with the name of the audio equipment maker, Macintosh Laboratory. The proposed computer became known as the Macintosh. Raskin envisioned a machine that would sell for $1,000 and be a simple appliance with screen and keyboard and computer all in one unit. To keep the cost down, he proposed a tiny five-inch screen and a very cheap and underpowered microprocessor, the Motorola 6809. Raskin fancied himself a philosopher, and he wrote his thoughts in an ever-expanding notebook that he called The Book of Macintosh. He also issued occasional manifestos. One of these was called Computers by the Millions, and it began with an aspiration. If personal computers are to be truly personal, it will have to be as likely as not that a family, picked at random, will own one. Throughout 1979 and early 1980, the Macintosh Project led a tenuous existence. Every few months it would almost get killed off, but each time Raskin managed to cajole Markula into granting clemency. It had a research team of only four engineers located in the original Apple office space next to the Good Earth restaurant, a few blocks from the company's new main building. The workspace was filled with enough toys and radio-controlled model airplanes, Raskin's passion, to make it look like a daycare center for geeks. Every now and then, work would cease for a loosely organized game of Nerf ball tag. Andy Hertzfeld recalled, this inspired everyone to surround their work area with barricades made out of cardboard to provide cover during the game, making part of the office look like a cardboard maze. The star of the team was a blonde, cherubic, and psychologically intense self-taught young engineer named Burl Smith, who worshipped the code work of Wozniak and tried to pull off similar dazzling feats. Atkinson discovered Smith working in Apple's service department and, amazed at his ability to improvise fixes, recommended him to Raskin. He would later succumb to schizophrenia, but in the early 1980s, he was able to channel his manic intensity into week-long binges of engineering brilliance. Jobs was enthralled by Raskin's vision, but not by his willingness to make compromises to keep down the cost. At one point in the fall of 1979, Jobs told him instead to focus on building what he repeatedly called an insanely great product. Don't worry about price, just specify the computer's abilities, Jobs told him. Raskin responded with a sarcastic memo. It spelled out everything you would want in the proposed computer. A high-resolution color display, a printer that worked without a ribbon and could produce graphics in color at a page per second, unlimited access to the ARPANET, and the capability to recognize speech and synthesize music, 
even simulate Caruso singing with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir with variable reverberation. The memo concluded, Starting with the abilities desired is nonsense. We must start both with a price goal and a set of abilities and keep an eye on today's and the immediate future's technology. In other words, Raskin had little patience for Jobs' belief that you could distort reality if you had enough passion for your product. Thus, they were destined to clash, especially after Jobs was ejected from the Lisa project in September 1980 and began casting around for someplace else to make his mark. It was inevitable that his gaze would fall on the Macintosh project. Raskin's manifestos about an inexpensive machine for the masses with a simple graphic interface and clean design, stirred his soul. And it was also inevitable that once Jobs set his sights on the Macintosh project, Raskin's days were numbered. Steve started acting on what he thought we should do, Jeff started brooding, and it instantly was clear what the outcome would be, recalled Joanna Hoffman, a member of the Mac team. The first conflict was over Raskin's devotion to the underpowered Motorola 6809 microprocessor. Once again, it was a clash between Raskin's desire to keep the max price under $1,000 and Jobs' determination to build an insanely great machine. So Jobs began pushing for the Mac to switch to the more powerful Motorola 68000, which is what the Lisa was using. Just before Christmas 1980, he challenged Burl Smith, without telling Raskin, to make a redesigned prototype that used the more powerful chip. As his hero Wozniak would have done, Smith threw himself into the task around the clock, working nonstop for three weeks and employing all sorts of breathtaking programming leaps. When he succeeded, Jobs was able to force the switch to the Motorola 68000 and Raskin had to brood and recalculate the cost of the Mac. There was something larger at stake. The cheaper microprocessor that Raskin wanted would not have been able to accommodate all of the gee whiz graphics, windows, menus, mouse, and so on, that the team had seen on the Xerox Park visits. Raskin had convinced everyone to go to Xerox Park, and he liked the idea of a bitmap display and windows but he was not as charmed by all the cute graphics and icons, and he absolutely detested the idea of using a point-and-click mouse rather than the keyboard. Some of the people on the project became enamored of the quest to do everything with the mouse, he later groused. Another example is the absurd application of icons. An icon is a symbol equally incomprehensible in all human languages. There's a reason why humans invented phonetic languages. Raskin's former student, Bill Atkinson, sided with Jobs. They both wanted a powerful processor that could support whizzier graphics and the use of a mouse. Steve had to take the project away from Jeff, Atkinson said. Jeff was pretty firm and stubborn, and Steve was right to take it over. The world got a better result. The disagreements were more than just philosophical. They became clashes of personality. I think that he likes people to jump when he says jump, Raskin once said. I felt that he was untrustworthy and that he does not take kindly to being found wanting. He doesn't seem to like people who see him without a halo. Jobs was equally dismissive of Raskin. Jeff was really pompous, he said. He didn't know much about interfaces, so I decided to nab some of his people who were really good, like Atkinson, bring in some of my own, take the thing over, and build a less expensive Lisa, not some piece of junk. Some on the team found Jobs impossible to work with. Jobs seems to introduce tension, politics, and hassles, rather than enjoying a buffer from those distractions. One engineer wrote in a memo to Raskin in December 1980, I thoroughly enjoy talking with him, and I admire his ideas, practical perspective, and energy, but I just don't feel that he provides the trusting, supportive, relaxed environment that I need. But many others realized that despite his temperamental failings, Jobs had the charisma and corporate clout that would lead them to make a dent in the universe.
Jobs told the staff that Raskin was just a dreamer, whereas he was a doer and would get the Mac done in a year. It was clear he wanted vindication for having been ousted from the Lisa group, and he was energized by competition. He publicly bet John Couch $5,000 that the Mac would ship before the Lisa. We can make a computer that's cheaper and better than the Lisa and get it out first, he told the team. Jobs asserted his control of the group by canceling a brown bag lunch seminar that Raskin was scheduled to give to the whole company in February 1981. Raskin happened to go by the room anyway and discovered that there were a hundred people there waiting to hear him. Jobs had not bothered to notify anyone else about his cancellation order, so Raskin went ahead and gave a talk. That incident led Raskin to write a blistering memo to Mike Scott, who once again found himself in the difficult position of being a president trying to manage a company's temperamental co-founder and major stockholder. It was titled, Working For Slash With Steve Jobs, and in it, Raskin asserted, He is a dreadful manager. I have always liked Steve, but I have found it impossible to work for him. Jobs regularly misses appointments. This is so well known as to be almost a running joke. He acts without thinking and with bad judgment. He does not give credit where due. Very often, when told of a new idea, he will immediately attack it and say that it is worthless or even stupid and tell you that it was a waste of time to work on it. This alone is bad management. But if the idea is a good one, he will soon be telling people about it as though it was his own. That afternoon, Scott called in Jobs and Raskin for a showdown in front of Markala. Jobs started crying. He and Raskin agreed on only one thing. Neither could work for the other one. On the Lisa project, Scott had sided with Couch. This time he decided it was best to let Jobs win. After all, the Mac was a minor development project housed in a distant building that could keep Jobs occupied away from the main campus. Raskin was told to take a leave of absence. They wanted to humor me and give me something to do, which was fine, Jobs recalled. It was like going back to the garage for me. I had my own ragtag team, and I was in control. Raskin's ouster may not have seemed fair, but it ended up being good for the Macintosh. Raskin wanted an appliance with little memory, an anemic processor, a cassette tape, no mouse, and minimal graphics. Unlike Jobs, he might have been able to keep the price down to close to $1,000, and that may have helped Apple win market share. But he could not have pulled off what Jobs did, which was to create and market a machine that would transform personal computing. In fact, we can see where the road not taken led. Raskin was hired by Canon to build the machine he wanted. It was the Canon Cat, and it was a total flop, Atkinson said. Nobody wanted it. When Steve turned the Mac into a compact version of the Lisa, it made it into a computing platform instead of a consumer electronic device. Texaco Towers a few days after Raskin left, Jobs appeared at the cubicle of Andy Hertzfeld, a young engineer on the Apple II team, who had a cherubic face and impish demeanor similar to his pal Burl Smith's. Hertzfeld recalled that most of his colleagues were afraid of Jobs because of his spontaneous temper tantrums and his proclivity to tell everyone exactly what he thought, which often wasn't very favorable. But Hertzfeld was excited by him. Are you any good? Jobs asked the moment he walked in. We only want really good people working on the Mac, and I'm not sure you're good enough. Hertzfeld knew how to answer. I told him that, yes, I thought I was pretty good. Jobs left, and Hertzfeld went back to his work. Later that afternoon, he looked up to see Jobs peering over the wall of his cubicle. I've got good news for you, he said. You're working on the Mac team now. Come with me. Hertzfeld replied that he needed a couple more days to finish the Apple II product he was in the middle of. What's more important than working on the Macintosh? Jobs demanded. 
Hertzfeld explained that he needed to get his Apple II DOS program in good enough shape to hand it over to someone. You're just wasting your time with that, Jobs replied. Who cares about the Apple II? The Apple II will be dead in a few years. The Macintosh is the future of Apple, and you're going to start on it now. With that, Jobs yanked out the power cord to Hertzfeld's Apple II, causing the code he was working on to vanish. Come with me, Jobs said. I'm going to take you to your new desk. Jobs drove Hertzfeld, computer and all, in his silver Mercedes to the Macintosh offices. Here's your new desk, he said, plopping him in a space next to Burl Smith. Welcome to the Mac team. The desk had been Raskin's. In fact, Raskin had left so hastily that some of the drawers were still filled with his flotsam and jetsam, including model airplanes. Jobs' primary test for recruiting people in the spring of 1981 to be part of his merry band of pirates was making sure they had a passion for the product. He would sometimes bring candidates into a room where a prototype of the Mac was covered by a cloth, dramatically unveil it, and watch. If their eyes lit up, if they went right for the mouse and started pointing and clicking, Steve would smile and hire them, recalled Andrea Cunningham. He wanted them to say, wow. Bruce Horn was one of the programmers at Xerox Park. When some of his friends, such as Larry Tesler, decided to join the Macintosh group, Horn considered going there as well. But he got a good offer and a $15,000 signing bonus to join another company. Jobs called him on a Friday night. You have to come into Apple tomorrow morning, he said. I have a lot of stuff to show you. Horn did, and Jobs hooked him. Steve was so passionate about building this amazing device that would change the world, Horn recalled. By sheer force of his personality, he changed my mind. Jobs showed Horn exactly how the plastic would be molded and would fit together at perfect angles and how good the board was going to look inside. He wanted me to see that this whole thing was going to happen, and it was thought out from end to end. Wow, I said, I don't see that kind of passion every day, so I signed up. Jobs even tried to re-engage Wozniak. I resented the fact that he had not been doing much, but then I thought, hell. I wouldn't be here without his brilliance, Jobs later told me. But as soon as Jobs was starting to get him interested in the Mac, Wozniak crashed his new single-engine Beechcraft while attempting a takeoff near Santa Cruz. He barely survived and ended up with partial amnesia. Jobs spent time at the hospital, but when Wozniak recovered, he decided it was time to take a break from Apple. Ten years after dropping out of Berkeley, he decided to return there to finally get his degree, enrolling under the name of Rocky Raccoon Clark. In order to make the project his own, Jobs decided it should no longer be codenamed after Raskin's favorite Apple. In various interviews, Jobs had been referring to computers as a bicycle for the mine. The ability of humans to create a bicycle allowed them to move more efficiently than even a condor and likewise the ability to create computers would multiply the efficiency of their minds. So one day Jobs decreed that henceforth the Macintosh should be known instead as the bicycle. This did not go over well. Burl and I thought this was the silliest thing we ever heard, and we simply refused to use the new name, recalled Hertzfeld. Within a month, the idea was dropped. By early 1981, the Mac team had grown to about 20, and Jobs decided that they should have bigger quarters. So he moved everyone to the second floor of a brown shingled two-story building about three blocks from Apple's main offices. It was next to a Texaco station and thus became known as Texaco Towers. In order to make the office more lively, he told the team to buy a stereo system. Burl and I ran out and bought a silver cassette-based boombox right away before he could change his mind, recalled Hertzfeld. Jobs' triumph was soon complete. A few weeks after winning his power struggle with Raskin to run the Mac division, he helped push out Mike Scott as Apple's president. Scotty had become more and more erratic, alternately bullying and nurturing. 
He finally lost most of his support among the employees when he surprised them by imposing a round of layoffs that he handled with atypical ruthlessness. In addition, he had begun to suffer a variety of afflictions, ranging from eye infections to narcolepsy. When Scott was on vacation in Hawaii, Markala called together the top managers to ask if he should be replaced. Most of them, including Jobs and John Couch, said yes. So Markala took over as an interim and rather passive president, and Jobs found that he now had full reign to do what he wanted with the Mac division. Chapter 11 The Reality Distortion Field Playing by His Own Set of Rules When Andy Hertzfeld joined the Macintosh team, he got a briefing from Bud Tribble, the other software designer, about the huge amount of work that still needed to be done. Jobs wanted it finished by January 1982, less than a year away. That's crazy, Hertzfeld said. There's no way. Tribble said that Jobs would not accept any contrary facts. The best way to describe the situation is a term from Star Trek, Tribble explained. Steve has a reality distortion field. When Hertzfeld looked puzzled, Tribble elaborated. In his presence, reality is malleable. He can convince anyone of practically anything. It wears off when he's not around, but it makes it hard to have realistic schedules. Tribble recalled that he adopted the phrase from the Menagerie episodes of Star Trek, in which the aliens create their own new world through sheer mental force. He meant the phrase to be a compliment as well as a caution. It was dangerous to get caught in Steve's distortion field, but it was what led him to actually be able to change reality. At first, Hertzfeld thought that Tribble was exaggerating, but after two weeks of working with Jobs, he became a keen observer of the phenomenon. The reality distortion field was a confounding melange of charismatic rhetorical style, indomitable will, and eagerness to bend any fact to fit the purpose at hand, he said. There was little that could shield you from the force, Hertzfeld discovered. Amazingly, the reality distortion field seemed to be effective even if you were acutely aware of it. We would often discuss potential techniques for grounding it, but after a while, most of us gave up accepting it as a force of nature. After Jobs decreed that the sodas in the office refrigerator be replaced by Odwalla organic orange and carrot juices, someone on the team had T-shirts made. Reality distortion field, they said on the front, and on the back, it's in the juice. To some people, calling it a reality distortion field was just a clever way to say that Jobs tended to lie. But it was, in fact, a more complex form of dissembling. He would assert something, be it a fact about world history or a recounting of who suggested an idea at a meeting, without even considering the truth. It came from willfully defying reality, not only to others, but to himself. He can deceive himself, said Bill Atkinson. It allowed him to con people into believing his vision, because he has personally embraced and internalized it. A lot of people distort reality, of course. When Jobs did so, it was often a tactic for accomplishing something. Wozniak, who was as congenitally honest as Jobs was tactical, marveled at how effective it could be. His reality distortion is when he has an illogical vision of the future, such as telling me that I could design the breakout game in just a few days. You realize that it can't be true, but he somehow makes it true. When members of the Mac team got ensnared in his reality distortion field, they were almost hypnotized. He reminded me of Rasputin, said Debbie Coleman. He laser-beamed in on you and didn't blink. It didn't matter if he was serving purple Kool-Aid, you drank it. But like Wozniak, she believed that the reality distortion field was empowering. It enabled Jobs to inspire his team to change the course of computer history with a fraction of the resources of Xerox or IBM. 
It was a self-fulfilling distortion, she claimed. You did the impossible because you didn't realize it was impossible. At the root of the reality distortion was Jobs' belief that the rules didn't apply to him. He had some evidence for this. In his childhood, he had often been able to bend reality to his desires. Rebelliousness and willfulness were ingrained into his character. He had the sense that he was special, a chosen one, an enlightened one. He thinks there are a few people who are special, people like Einstein and Gandhi and the gurus he met in India, and he's one of them, said Hertzfeld. He told Chris Ann this. Once he even hinted to me that he was enlightened. It's almost like Nietzsche. Jobs never studied Nietzsche, but the philosopher's concept of the will to power and the special nature of the uberman came naturally to him. As Nietzsche wrote in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the spirit now wills his own will, and he who had been lost to the world now conquers the world. If reality did not comport with his will, he would ignore it, as he had done with the birth of his daughter and would do years later when first diagnosed with cancer. Even in small, everyday rebellions, such as not putting a license plate on his car and parking it in handicapped spaces, he acted as if he were not subject to the strictures around him. Another key aspect of Jobs' worldview was his binary way of categorizing things. People were either enlightened or an asshole. Their work was either the best or totally shitty. Bill Atkinson, the Mac designer who fell on the good side of these dichotomies, described what it was like. It was difficult working under Steve, because there was a great polarity between gods and shitheads. If you were a god, you were up on a pedestal and could do no wrong. Those of us who were considered to be gods, as I was, knew that we were actually mortal and made bad engineering decisions and farted like any person so we were always afraid that we would get knocked off our pedestal. The ones who were shitheads, who were brilliant engineers working very hard, felt there was no way they could get appreciated and rise above their status. But these categories were not immutable, for Jobs could rapidly reverse himself. When briefing Hertzfeld about the reality distortion field, Tribble specifically warned him about Jobs' tendency to resemble high-voltage alternating current. Just because he tells you that something is awful or great, it doesn't necessarily mean he'll feel that way tomorrow, Tribble explained. If you tell him a new idea, he'll usually tell you that he thinks it's stupid. But then, if he actually likes it, exactly one week later, he'll come back to you and propose your idea to you, as if he thought of it.